Hello and welcome to your first ever episode of Core Balance Hanging. And yes, I do have my shirt off. I'm going to be demonstrating some core hanging, which is something that I have been doing in my life as a decompression and relief technique on a pretty regular basis for many years now. And I think it's finally time I share it with the Core Balance community. And I've had requests from students recently to demonstrate more things with my shirt off so that it's easier to see the core connection and just what's going on with my abdominal muscles. So uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna try and just keep this super simple. It doesn't have to be complicated with hanging. Uh, I mean, it can be, but we're just gonna try and keep it a super simple and focus on one thing, which is core connection, uh, obviously. And uh, that, that is what I believe is the most important thing to get the direct benefits on your core and your spine when performing uh, hanging activity like this. So I'll be de demonstrating in a few different ways. I, have a, I actually have a, a bar right above my desk conveniently. So uh, I get to use that on a regular basis whenever I want. I can just be sitting here and just kind of grab on. Uh, and also I'll show you some more views on uh, that right there. So the first kind of lesson is you don't have to have an actual pull-up bar to do hanging. Uh, before I moved into this office, I would hang off an orange tree branch right out our backyard here. And before that, I lived in a studio apartment and didn't really have anything to hang from. So I installed this uh, pipe you can get from your local uh, hardware store just a pipe and some some end pieces and you can screw it into uh, you know a weight bearing uh, rafter or something that that can hold your weight and um, and you can create something to hang from and and most likely if you get creative around your house you you can find something to hang from whether it's you know, an, a part of a staircase or like this is a loft or just a beam randomly above your desk. Uh, that's the first thing I wanted to go over is just you can find something to hang from. And the second is if you're afraid of, you know, not being able to do this because you're not strong enough to hold your body weight. Uh, absolutely, you can do this. Hanging doesn't have to be 100% of your full body weight. It can be uh, any fraction, any percentage of your body weight that you want. And so we're going to talk about how to do that, um, how to support your weight partially while hanging. And then we're also just going to demonstrate a phenomenal way to create decompression in your spine, in your lower back. And uh, so that's going to be adding a little bit of a, you know, the breathing technique that I teach in the program to, to the hang. So. First, let's just talk about uh, let's talk about core connection. So I'm not going to show any slides or images today. I'm just going to demonstrate uh, right here in front of you, and we're going to prioritize the abdominal muscles. So uh, the main connection you want to have is from your rib cage here to the pubic bone, and your abdominal muscles are the main connection there. That and you want to imagine them as like a rope or a group of ropes and you want those ropes to be taut throughout the hang and if you don't do that then the the force of gravity of the force of the hang is going to go through whatever tissues that uh, that passive hanging decides to go through you know gravity is just going to choose typically the weakest link to hang through and so that's I, not, uh, not always the best way, place to get decompression. So you want to have some control over that. You want to choose where the force of the hang goes through. And the best way to get the most benefit from hanging is to keep your abdominal muscles tight. And I'll demonstrate that right now. So uh, I showed you the bar I'm going to be hanging from right here. And uh, the first thing I can just show you is a relaxed hang. You can see my rib cage flaring out, and this doesn't feel very decompressing for my spine. And so if I engage my abdominals, you can see that uh, the rib flare disappears, 
and there is more of a there is more of a like a straight line you can see what happens to my pelvis uh, when I connect so I'm disconnected I'm gonna connect my pelvis comes forward my pubic bone comes forward and I actually came prepared to demonstrate this from a side view so let's try this so if you can't hear me while I'm hanging, I'll just say first I'll do disconnected and then I will do I will connect and you can see what happens to my pelvis. So this is disconnected. You can see rib flare. And when I connect you can see that the, the pelvis comes forward, the pubic bone comes forward. Uh, you also might have noticed that I wasn't hanging straight up and down. That's because my feet are on the floor and I'm supporting a, a percentage of my body weight with my feet and you can do that too. So ideally your hang bar is tall enough that you can be off the ground to some degree but, but low enough that you can still stand. I'm standing right now and I can control the amount of weight that I put into my body because I can take some weight off of my legs. So it's a really easy way to, you know, to be able to control how, how much force is going through your hang. Um, and as soon as you are able to make that connection with your abdominals and maintain that connection uh, and, and give your, your spine a little decompression, uh, you're going to, you're going to feel the benefits. Uh, there, I'm, there are a couple things I want to go over, so I'm going to demonstrate um, back on the loft here, and uh, we're going to show some techniques for adding more decompression to your hang, and also turning it into a bit of an exercise, so you can actually train your core muscles um, and to uh, it's movement retraining to be able to maintain that connection uh, with leg movements and stuff like that. So. Uh, the first thing I'll show you is I have a little step stool right there and that's where I'm going to be uh, touching, tapping my feet to and uh, when I turn it into an exercise. And uh, the other thing is I usually face the wall when I do this because I do do this on a regular basis but for the purposes of this video I'm going to be facing the camera obviously and so uh, just my arms, my hands will be facing backwards. But I, I normally recommend hanging with your hands facing forwards. So, uh, so let's go ahead and do this. Lower this a little bit. So this is what a full hang looks like. Um, if you want to go 100% body weight, you can just lift your knees up. And notice I do one knee at a time. I have that connection in place. And it's a lot less stressful on the spine to do one leg at a time or you can alternate and you can just hang hang kind of like a gorilla and so this is um, an opportunity to add some movements if you notice I never lose connection if you notice I continue to breathe and so this is an advanced way to do an exercise like the back anchor progression if you're in the program or uh, you know if you're not in the program it's a pretty simple uh, priority the the goal is to maintain that rope taut throughout the entire hang and if you let go of the tautness of that rope if you uh, disconnect then it could potentially if you notice I'll show you one more time if you notice when I'm disconnected and I'm hanging there is, there is a lot of arch in my lower back and that potentially could have a negative effect on your back so so this is disconnected connected and I can put my feet up disconnected that's not decompression that is not decompression on the lower back that is decompression. So, so you can see the difference 
uh, how important it is to have that abdominal connection. And uh, so we're going to add the last element, which is if you want to get a phenomenal level of decompression in your spine. Uh, if you're in the program, you already know that we teach a breathing technique for decompression. You're going to add that breathing into your lower back to the hang. So one more time, demonstrate here. And then I will get to your questions in the chat. So you can't really see it, but I will just go ahead and breathe into my lower back. Exhale. And you do a round of 10 breaths like that, you're going to feel different in, in your spine, your lower backs probably going to be a little bit happier. And so that is uh, the lesson for today. Let me let me look at uh, the chat real quick. Anthony, uh, hello and welcome. Uh, asks, should this be done before or after a workout? Uh, I don't think it really matters. It could, it could be used before a workout to actually activate your abdominal muscles and align your spine. And so that whatever workout you're going to do after that, you're going to be in better alignment. Your abdominals are going to be more active and participating in whatever you're doing. That's the goal. And or you could do it after as a form of cool down and decompression if you're lifting heavy weights or something like that. That's a good question. Uh, Brian McGuire, should we still focus on breathing into the back and keeping focus on til uh, tilting pelvis forward? Uh, so I, I, that's a great question because I just covered that. So yes, ideally you want to breathe into your lower back, but and, and normally that's the priority above everything. If you're in the program, uh, you know, throughout all the exercises, the number one priority is breathe into your lower back and then add the, the next layer of the exercise. With this, I would say the top priority is the abdominal connection. And that kind of goes together with breathing in your lower back. But you, you're going to have to have a lot stronger connection. The intensity is much higher depending on how much you're hanging. So that's the priority. Breathing in, into the lower back can be kind of more of a layer on top of that. If you know you can maintain a strong enough connection that your pelvis is not tilting anteriorly. We, we, we kind of want the pelvis to be tilting posteriorly. And, and that's where the length, you can see there's more length in the lumbar spine when your abdominals are connected and the pelvis is tilted more posteriorly. So another good question. In the past, I've tried hanging like this, but since my pelvis was tilted back, it hurt. Yeah, so that's exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, thank you for sharing, Brian. And so when, the way I describe tilted back, you're saying tilted back, uh, I would describe that as an anterior pelvic tilt. So um, a little bit of a different description, but yeah. Uh, we can hear you. Thank you, Asti and uh, Brian. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Answered already. So uh, that's the questions in the chat. Um, I hope I went over everything. If there's any other questions, feel free to ask. We are uh, going to go into the Q&A portion of the stream. I'm going to put my shirt on for that. I'm just trying to make sure I covered everything before actually uh, throwing the shirt on. So. Uh, if you have any questions, type it out and I will, uh, I'll put my shirt on. So give me one moment here. <clears throat> and just so you guys know, I do this not every day, but on an as needed basis. Uh, I do spend a lot of time on the computer, which is not good for the spine. And so, uh, you know, I'll just reach up and grab. Uh, if I start feeling my back, I'll reach up and grab and do a couple breaths. Uh, if you want to try and turn it into an exercise, uh, 10 breaths is uh, a really good length of time. I, I, pref I prefer to count breaths rather than seconds because it, it encourages the focus on the breath rather than trying to focus on seconds and breathing. So just combine them and, and you can, you know, the, the more body weight you're putting into your uh, into your hang, the less time you're going to be able to hang. Usually the forearm muscles are what go first. Um, but the other, uh, the other factor is if you do less body weight, you might be able to get your abdominal muscles to fatigue first, which is a great abdominal exercise. Um, I do remember I did 
kind of forget to share my tapping exercise that I do. Um, so I'm going to show you one more time and I'll, I'll face the wall so you can actually see from the back because I don't think you've had that view. So, so I have that stool there. I'm going to be tapping it. So this is a relaxed hang. And you can put your feet up on the stool now. <clears throat> relaxed, connected. And so you can turn it into a supported tap. Or you can go unsupported. So that probably wasn't the best view of that, but uh, hopefully you get the gist. And hello, Anna. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Glad to see you. So, so shirt gone back on. We're going to switch gears. Uh, we're going to go into the Q&A portion. I believe we have a bunch of questions prepared from the students. And uh, hopefully that was helpful. If this turns out uh, good enough as a video once we edit it down, this might become a lesson in the program. So um, I'm hoping that's the case because I feel like it's time for me to share this with you guys. I've been using it myself and it's not something that's been in the program. So. I'm probably going to feel the best I've ever felt today after my stream. Usually I can feel my body wanting to go move because I've been sitting for the whole stream. But uh, I can already tell that I'm going to be feeling good. And maybe I'll be able to go surfing after. I can get my hair. There we go. All right. Oh, okay. Glass is on. I got to open up the questions here. Give me a second. So that's a little insight into my daily routine. And yeah, it's been really, I, I've really, I've really been grateful for the benefits of hanging. And I don't, and I don't do a whole lot of pull-ups. Uh, I just mostly just hang and gives me a lot of benefit. All right. So, looks like we have a student of the week. Let me make sure, yep. Looks like we have a student of the week, so let me share that with you guys. We have a new tradition that we started a few weeks back. I think this is week three or week four of this new tradition. So, uh, we honor a student of the week in the student hub. And before I, uh, in, I announce the student of the week this week, I'm going to answer a question that just came through the chat. So uh, Pauliette asks, are pull-ups a good exercise as well? And it's not a clear answer because pull-ups strengthen the latissimus muscles, latissimus dorsi. And those muscles typically are a power muscle. They're superficial and they could potentially be uh, a compensatory muscle in the predictable pattern of muscle imbalances. And so we don't typically need to strengthen uh, those muscles. You know, there are more muscles involved in a pull-up, but that's the major muscle per performing the motion. And so it's not necessarily gonna benefit lower back pain to do pull-ups. Uh, but that said, if you are um, if you're confident in your core connection and your ability to maintain the engagement of your deep core muscles and your, you know, all the deep and superficial abdominal muscles, then adding a pull up as a layer on top of that is a great way to do some movement retraining. And you get the decompression from the pull up as well. And yeah, a great way to tr just train your body, but you want to prioritize that, prioritize that core connection. I personally don't do pull-ups because I get enough training from uh, doing from surfing, from paddling on a surfboard. It's pulling. It's a pulling motion, very repetitive. So for anybody who's a swimmer or a rock climber 
or a rower, you're not really going to need to do pull-ups. What you'll benefit more from is cross training, doing something that trains the opposite muscles of the muscle that you typically overtrain. So that would be push-ups or uh, like handstands. Uh, and if you're not, uh, you know, in, in that caliber of fitness, uh, there are always regressions of um, any exercise. So this hang, I showed you the regression, which is support your legs. You can put a chair under your legs, you can put a stool under your legs, or you can just have your hang bar low enough that you can, your legs can be on the ground. So that's um, a really great um, way to control the intensity of the exercise. Another thing is that, uh, you know, when you are at maximum uh, intensity. So imagine like both my knees are up. You're going to get uh, not only the benefits of the core connection and the movement retraining, but you're going to get strength. You're going to be building strength because you are challenging your, your ability to maintain connection with a lot of force. So, uh, so yeah, I kind of went on a tangent there, but yeah, that's my answer about pull-ups plus a little more. Uh, Kellen asks, uh, hello Kellen and, and welcome. What other things like this can I do when my back is hurting from sitting uh, at a computer for a long time? This exercise does seem awesome. Excited to try it. Um, other things would be for sure walking. Uh, if you're in the program, the bridge. Uh, if you're not in the program, I can't just recommend the bridge because it's the most commonly uh, wrong common wrongly done exercise and so you can actually hurt yourself doing the bridge but if you do it with core connection the right way uh, it's a phenomenal counterbalance to sitting it opens the hips where sitting closes the hips the bridge opens the hips so like my ideal like I, I kind of would imagine somebody wanting to ask me this question what would I do in this situation where I've been sitting at a computer all day long and my back hurts well what I would probably do is I would start with a hang, uh, maybe a low intensity hang. Some days I'm feeling not very strong, so I'll support most of my body weight on my legs and uh, just start and breathe into my back and get some decompression. Then I'd probably go into a bridge and uh, open the front of my hips with, uh, you know, with uh, core connection and breathing and, and stretch out my hip flexors. And then I would go for a nice long walk. If you have the time, go for an hour and a half. If you don't have enough time, uh, go for 30 minutes. And I bet after doing a hang and a bridge with good core connection and then a walk, uh, you'll be feeling like a million bucks. Uh, and if that's not the case, then it's an indicator that you have some muscle imbalances that are you know, existing in your body and, and and the joints are not really in good alignment. And so that kind of movement is actually causing friction. And so the, in that case, what you would do is you would have to prioritize restoring muscular balance in your body. And well, that's what we do in the program. So you start really light and it's a complicated process. So uh, if, you're, if you're in the program, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, then I would just recommend doing the free trial and you can get a really good example of uh, what we do in the first week. It's very low intensity, very high effectiveness uh, stuff. Uh, great question. And uh, so here we go. So Student Hub Student of the Week. We introduced the Student Hub about a month ago and we are rewarding a student each week for uh, just participation, for commenting on other people's posts, helping other people out, uh, asking questions and, and welcoming new students to the program. This week's student of the week is Leah Bobal. So congratulations, Leah. Uh, thank you for sharing your progress and giving guidance to other students. Uh, we're going to give you a free month to your membership of the program. So uh, you don't have to do anything. We're just going to throw a month right on top of your membership. And we appreciate you and, and thank you for contributing and we hope you continue to contribute. So uh, congrats to Leah, and uh, we'll be back again next week for another student of the week. So uh, we're gonna move on to the questions. So uh, we do this every week, live Q&A for uh, some of the better questions, 
more relevant questions uh, in the student hub that we believe can help uh, more people. So the first question comes from Elaine and uh, Elaine asks, uh, or maybe it's not a question. Let's see. Well, it looks like I'm going to be stopped at the plank push-up with core anchors. I have a shoulder that will probably get surgery sometime this year, and there's no way I can do a plank, even the regressions. The bird dog is done with wounded paw. I like that. That's kind of cute. So I kind of do that, but darn. Guess I'll stick with the bridge stuff for now. So Elaine, I have uh, good news for you. You can do the plank, and I'll show you how. So the, uh, the thing with shoulders is that the most like vast majority of shoulder injuries, whether it's acute or chronic, so traumatic or just gradual breakdown. I'm going to go full screen for this. Uh, you know, like just gradual wear and tear on the shoulder or a, a traumatic injury. The vast majority of injuries involve what's called instability. The shoulder joint is not stable enough and it kind of hurts to lift your arm up because it pops over, uh, you know, the joint and weight bearing hurts. Uh, you just can't hold the weight. So what you can do as a regression is you can control exactly how much weight you want to put into your shoulder by doing whatever you would do on the floor up against a wall. And so I will just use right here as an example. So if you can get your arms up to this far, then you can do this. And also, you should be able to get your arms up that far because this is the safe zone. Anything up to 90 degrees and out to 90 degrees is the safe zone for the shoulder. So you're not gonna hurt your shoulder uh, getting your arms up that far. We're gonna go up against the wall and you can uh, get some weight into your shoulder and you can control it. Uh, that might've been five pounds of pressure and uh, you can control it by moving your feet farther away from the wall. And so if I go a little farther back, now I've got maybe 15, 20 pounds of pressure. And actually I'm not really doing anything except feeling the control of my shoulder girdle. Uh, and the reason is because the best way to stabilize a shoulder is through weight bearing. And so just adding a little weight to this, uh, a, you know, this pressure on my shoulder, this right here is good for my shoulder, especially if I have an injury. So just wait there and feel all those muscles activate. And if you feel like you can tolerate more, just walk your feet back and uh, you can, that is a version of a plank. It's an inclined plank. Um, and if you're wondering, well, how does that benefit the shoulder? It doesn't seem like you're doing anything. It encourages something called co-contraction. Co-contraction means that all the muscles surrounding the joint are contracting together like a team. And when you get that kind of co-contraction, it provides stability for the joint. It hugs the joint. And so when you have an injury that's typically unstable, you want to add stability and uh, that's the best way to do it. So you can progress as exactly to the degree that you need by just gradually walking your feet back over a period of weeks and months. And if you can get to the point where you can weight bear on your ground, on the ground, like you said you were doing bird dog with a wounded paw, so that might've been a little uncomfortable for you. If you can get to the point where you can weight bear in quadruped on hands and knees in bird dog confidently with the shoulders locked down, uh, that will be even better for the shoulder. And you can actually build your shoulder stability up to the point where you might be able to avoid surgery. And it's through the same strategy of progression that we do in the program. We do that with the core and the lower back, but you can apply this strategy of progression to the shoulder or the knee or the hip or any other joint. The progression is the most, it's the, it's the magic potion that can get you to, to be able to avoid surgery. Um, and I don't know your full situation, so it might be that you actually do need surgery, but I wanted to let you know about that possibility. Uh, I'm noticing that the gardener is here for the neighbor, and you're probably going to be hearing that in a very annoying way. So I'm going to plug my microphone in because I think it helps with outside noise. So give me a second here. 
see if I can do this. Okay, so this might sound a little better for you guys. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and go into the next question. This is from Diane, and I believe Diane was the student of the week last week. So uh, she made the Q&A again. And uh, let's see what she has to say. So I'm not sure why, but I'm still having difficulty with the hinge despite keeping my knees soft and bending at the hip while keeping the back straight, okay? Okay, uh, when pushing glutes back, just like the video Dr. Ryan shared, I back off on intensity since my hamstring flared up, weighted to, and reintroduced and still not getting it, feeling lower back pain despite ensuring gut is pulled in just like the video. Okay, so it sounds like, Diane, uh, you understand what to do. You understand the concept. I would describe what you do in you, with your core a little differently than pulling the gut in. I fear that the way you described that by pulling the gut in, uh, I feel... I, I fear that you might be doing what's called abdominal hollowing, which is actually shown in the research to decrease stability in the spine. Um, that's a cue that people who practice Pilates and yoga uh, give. So they say, you know, pull in your stomach, pull in your belly button uh, to this, towards the spine. We do not do that in this program. Uh, the research has shown that the, the uh, abdominal bracing is a much more effective way to create stability for the spine and abdominal hollowing is, uh, is potentially decreasing the stability in the spine. So I would like you to change your cue, even if you're doing it right. Uh, the self cue is to connect pubic bone to rib cage or connect to your back anchor or connect to your front, front anchors, whatever is the most powerful for you. Um, and and maybe that can be of help. I don't think that uh, the, your problem is going to be solved by one switch of anything. I think that it's going to be a combination of giving your body more time. It might be that your hamstring is uh, not is a little compromised. And when you have one weak link of the chain, it's going to affect the rest of the chain. So uh, I, I believe it was last week that we talked about this. Uh, and maybe one week isn't enough, especially with hamstring injuries. They can go on for weeks and weeks and months. Actually, it's like one of the number one injuries that takes baseball players out of uh, out of the game because they are they need to be given a lot of rest. We use the hamstrings every day, all day long when we're doing things, and so it's hard for them to get enough rest and it takes longer for them to heal. So maybe give the hamstring a little more time, maybe change the way that you're connecting with your core or the cue that you're giving yourself for how you connected. Uh, glutes back is a very good cue and, um, and you're lowering the intensity, you're doing everything I would say. So it might be a matter of uh, just those first two things that we talked about. And uh, I always would encourage you to consider lowering the intensity even more because a hip hinge can be as simple as this. And this is what you have to do when you're brushing your teeth, right? And you got to spit into the sink. And so it's a functional movement and it's uh, way more, way healthier than, than going like this to spit in the sink, right? It comes from here. And this, these muscles are much more powerful. They're designed for movement than uh, these muscles that are, um, you know, designed for stability of the spine. So, so uh, that's a recommendation is just turn it down even more and just get to the point where you, you know, you're just doing enough just to wash the dishes or just to, uh, you know, like do the most miniature hip hip hinge that you can that you can possibly do and that and progress from there it's all about progression uh next question is from uh daniel and joseph 
So uh, because these must be similar topics. So uh, Daniel says, I really like the alternate bridge on the foam roller where your feet are on the foam roller. This is much more difficult for me to do. And I find I have to really focus on the back anchor engagement and glute engagement. For me, it allowed for a deeper sense of feeling the, the muscle connection, having spinal fusion and an ongoing low back muscle spasms. My sense, it got to the core of this program and an ongoing low back muscle spasms. My sense it got to the core. I think there's a spelling error. I'm not really sure. Um, no pun intended. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think, I think it's just a pun. All right, cool. Uh, thoughts on what a good holding time would be 15 seconds, 30 seconds. And then Joseph says, I get knee pain when I do the bridge. Uh, okay. Different question. So, uh, hold time for the bridge. Daniel is going to be um, the amount of time that you are able to maintain connection uh, with good form and continuous breathing and a strong, not only abdominal pubic bone to rib cage connection, but the deep core, uh, check that you're getting fat and, and, you know, frequently check with your fingers and, um, maintain that connection while continuously breathing. Uh, that's as, for as long as you can go. So it could be five minutes. Yeah, you know, I, I think my longest bridge is probably north of 10 minutes. And uh, I, I think I felt like a million bucks after getting up from that. Uh, so it's we just spend so much time in, in a hip flexed position uh, because we sit so much that it's like 10 minutes in the opposite position is actually insignificant, but uh, it really can make a big difference in how you feel. So so the priority is not the time, the priority is the breathing and the core connection. And if you can go longer, uh, just make sure you are staying focused on those priorities and not prioritizing how long can I go? Because then you will start to lose benefits if you connect, your core connection is going away but you're like, oh, I can, I want to hold it longer. Uh, the benefits actually can reverse if you're doing it without the connection. We're trying to train the body that way. So, uh, yes, I can show the slides. I did not realize that they were not showing. So back to the slides. Thank you for letting me know. Asti. Uh, so hopefully that answered your question, Daniel and Joseph says, I get knee pain when I do the bridges. The bridges have eliminated a lot of my SI joint pain, but it has caused knee pain. Any suggestions? Uh, yeah, so SI joint pain, I, I don't know how far you are in the program, but SI joint pain is typically most benefited by the butt buster bridge. So I'm assuming you're referring mostly to that one. Um, potentially the normal bridge can help SI joint pain too, but uh, by far people benefit mostly from the butt buster bridge and that's in module four, I believe. Uh, so ha if you haven't gotten there then you have something even more to look forward to. Uh, but with the knee pain, that movement of pushing out and the butt buster can irritate the knee and, uh, on the normal bridge can also irritate the knee because you, uh, you have the knee in a, in a, kind of an extreme as the knee is not an extreme position but the hip opening and the knee flexing together makes for the hip flexors to be in a very lengthened position and when they're taught if there's an imbalance from the lateral muscles to the medial muscles typically the lateral muscles are tighter it's going to pull the kneecap over and that is going to kind of potentially cause some irritation in the knee is not surprising and um immediate things that you can do are you could place a like a a, play, a playground ball sized ball or pillow between your knees and just gently put some pressure to squeeze your knees together while doing the bridge i wouldn't encourage doing a lot of pressure because uh, that's not uh, going to be a goal for the rest of the body but just a gentle amount of pressure can activate those medial, those inner knee muscles and help pull that kneecap to center. And uh, maybe it will cause less irritation for the knee. And the long run uh, solution is going to be uh, restoring muscular balance in your body, which is what you're doing right now by completing the program. Uh, there's a lot of things going on in the program. And one of the, the underlying themes from day one all the way through to the end is we are doing things that are restoring muscular balance. And typically over the period of the three months of the program, 
students will report that their knees and their hips feel a lot better. And so it might just be a matter of time, but the bridge is, like I said, gonna potentially highlight some, some knee issues, some existing knee issues. It's not causing knee pain because it's the source of your problem. It's just bringing to light some, some muscle imbalances by uh, doing something that is uh, kind of challenging for the body and, and bringing tissues to their end range. So that's, that's where you expose certain, certain things that uh, may not be v something that you feel on a normal basis, but they're there. And so, uh, yeah, hopefully that answers uh, your question and it's a little short term strategy and, and a longer term strategy as well. So we'll move on to the next question. Next slide from uh, Leah, student of the week, and also uh, Michelle. So uh, let's see. Uh, Leah says, I'm now in module six and want to share how much I enjoyed the video and the reminder to walk daily. My lower back hips sciatica pain is virtually gone while doing this program. I feel so strong in my core. It's really quite encouraging. Thank you. Uh, you're so welcome, Leah. I'm so happy and proud to hear that. Uh, this is what this is here for and uh, kind of warms my heart to hear that. So thank you. Uh, however, now I'm dealing with shoulder, upper back, and neck pain. I worked previously with another PT and Cairo for these, which are largely caused by my long-term TMD and bruxism. Uh, I know it as TMJ, but I'm sure they've changed uh, temporomandibular dysfunction. I'm guessing the J is, yeah, everybody has a TMJ, right? I have a TMJ, so, so uh, dysfunction of the TMJ. Uh, any tips, exercises for these areas? And then uh, I believe Michelle has the same thing. So I've also started having shoulder and upper back pain in module six, especially with the squat lesson. I feel pain in my mid and upper back. Would like to know if I'm doing anything wrong. So it's interesting that the first place you go, Michelle, is to wonder if you're doing something wrong. And I, I'm going to go ahead and say probably not. Uh, I think that most likely in in both cases with Leah and Michelle that you are what you're feeling is the pain that used to be in your lower back the is, that was from muscle tension and muscle imbalances kind of migrating to a different area and while that's pr probably pretty annoying it's actually a wonderful thing because it means especially if you've had lower back pain going on for a long time it means that you've you've targeted the right area and you've made a change you know the worst thing that could happen is the pain doesn't move the pain doesn't change and you do exercises and you still have the pain the next best thing is the pain moves to somewhere else and so the goal for both of you is going to be to continue to listen to your body and do the things to continue to target that pain and hopefully make it, you know, migrate out of your body. And so with with the upper back and neck uh, pain, we're gonna assume that since it did move there, that it's highly, highly likely that it's muscular because if it's a joint, you know, damage, typically that's not going to be able to move, right? You can't just move damage from one joint to the next, but muscles are dynamic. They're fluid and they and tension can flow through them to different areas. And so uh, you're going to want to be able to learn how to do whatever movements you're doing in module six, it sounds like. So functional movements, walking, hip hinge, uh, you know, squat, stuff like that. And uh, that tension that you're feeling up there in those muscles, try and send it lower. Uh, we tend to hold tension up high, you know, lower, with lower back pain. Uh, the common place to hold tension is in your hip flexors and quads. Uh, with upper back and neck pain, we tend to hold uh, tension in our delt in our uh, yeah in our deltoids and some of the other muscles that I'm not going to name. And so. Uh, just having more centeredness in your body, more core connection, more more uh, core based movement. Well, you can it can help it can help to allow you to send that tension that that strain that you're using to do those movements lower 
and rely more on your core muscles and keep these up here relaxed. And it, and the other area that the the other intention that the the that the pain could be caused from is uh, over pushing away from your upper front anchor. So like tr trying to stay too military posture is what they call it. Um, maybe it, it could be benefit you to allow yourself to to not slump, but just if you imagine soft knees when you're doing a squat, it's like soft knees, but in your upper back. So you're not fully uh, locked out in maximum, uh, you know, military posture, but you just kind of allow a little softness into your posture and those mus muscles might be able to breathe a little more because that's really what, what muscle pain often is, is not, they're not getting enough blood flow, not enough oxygen because they're too tense. And so... Uh, it's going to be a, it's a, it's a, a dance that you're going to be playing and you're going to be able to, you're going to have to find that level of connection and that level of, um, intensity that works best for you. And that's a matter of feeling. So I can't tell you like a number, like five out of 10, uh, to that's your magic number. Cause it's going to be a little bit different for everybody. And, and usually it's not 10 out of 10 and, and you need to have some level of t intensity to, to in the beginning to maintain the posture. And, and if you can find that magic number for yourself and then practice it long enough, it can become automatic. So, uh, that's my encouragement to you is, you know, find it and stick with it. And over months you know six months to a year uh it might just be such that you are able to do those movements and and focus on other things um but for now you this is where this is where the problem lies so i know that's not like probably the instant solution you're looking for but it is my best answer and hopefully it helps you i hope i got all those questions um yeah, Leah, you mentioned TMD. So, you know, mouth guard when you're sleeping, probably you already do that. And also, this is tension here. This is tension um, from potentially stress. And so uh, there are uh, stress reduction, uh, you know, practices like meditation, changing the way that you look at the stressful things. And also, um, you know, trying to send that tension lower, lower down into your body. All right. So next slide is from Erica. And uh, she says, I'm on day four and not sure I've had a breakthrough or maybe I wasn't doing the exercises correctly. I've been having trouble with marching in place. I could barely, barely on my feet. Okay. I could barely unweight my feet. I think that's what you meant to say. Um, I just stuck with it today and all of a sudden I was lifting my feet. Is it okay to have a sudden breakthrough like that? Oh, that's so interesting. So you, you kind of were not having a breakthrough and just on day four today, sounds like you had the breakthrough. And I absolutely want to say it's okay. It's uh, more than okay. It's excellent. It's expected from me because I've seen so many students go through the program, Erica, that have had a breakthrough like this. And typically I've found that most of the progress that students have come in little mini breakthroughs and aha moments like that. So today something connected for you and uh, you know, you the work that you did on the previous three days uh, w was uh, accumulated to to make that connection today and those are the days that are the, that are the most important the breakthrough days are the days to celebrate but the days when you don't break through those are the days where you get the benefit and i think a lot of high level athletes agree that it's the hard days at practice that are the most beneficial and the days when you're on fire and you have breakthroughs and and great things happen that's that's just the benefit of all the hard work you put in so keep at it um, and be uh, anyone that is watching this, be proud of yourself for the days when you don't have a breakthrough because they, they're leading to one. 
Uh, so next, Erica, let's say, let's see. Also, this is my first day practicing the bridge, which I am relearning due to several years of yoga. I try to stay consciously attuned to my back anchor and not go for a full bridge. Hard to tell how high I was getting, but my legs were quivering. I was trying to engage my glutes, but legs continued quivering. Is that expected? It is expected because it's the predictable pattern but it's also the pattern we're trying to break out of. And so it sounds like you're overusing your quads, which is predictable. It's uh, the pattern that I was in. It's uh, called quad dominant uh, movement, quad dominant pattern. Um, it's in line with limb dominance, overusing the limbs to do movements and underusing the core. So we wanna to move towards core dominance and that's gonna take work. That's gonna take days and days of repetition. And so each time you do the bridge, I want you to just focus on bringing that energy more towards your core and the core and the glutes can be the, your source of power, just like what you did today. And over time, you can gradually have less quivering and less work done by the quads through that intention. The other thing is that there will be a uh, bridge progression uh, to bridge progressions introduced later in the program where it takes away this leg uh, dominance. So uh, I'm going to just have you continue to practice where you're at because the program is designed the way it is on purpose um, in order in, and time release of things for your benefit. So keep practicing the bridge the way you are. And then once you get to, I think it might even be next module or module three, you will be introduced to um, bridge progression on the foam roll that can take out your quads. It can almost completely take them out of the equation and force you to use your glutes, your core, and the hamstrings help a bit too. Um, so, yep, that's coming your way. And then uh, you also say, when I got up, I noticed that my mid thoracic pain was absent, which is awesome. So I'm taking this as a good sign. Definitely a good sign. Listen to your body. It gives you good feelings too, which are equally as important as the pain feelings. You need to listen to both and do more of what's working and less of what's hurting. So uh, let's go on to the next question. It looks like we're going to be doing an hour stream today because this is my last question. And uh, this one is from Joshua. Uh, Joshua, you say, I have a question about keeping my core engaged by 10% all day, which is what I believe you recommend. Uh, that's a good question. I need to be a little more clear on what I recommend around that. And I, and I, I know that. So I'm um, glad you asked. Let's see what else you have to say. For me, my ribs do not stick out while moving through my day. However, if I fully relax, my stomach always sticks out at all times of the day, regardless of whether I've eaten or not. I'm not overweight and think that maybe this is a sign that I have lost my core connection over the years and that is why I have a bulge, have bulging discs, stenosis, etc. Is this assessment accurate at all? Will sucking in my stomach, which automatically happens when I connect my anchors and push out my breath, count as the core connection you refer to when saying we need to intentionally keep our core connected all day? Okay, I think that's enough for me to answer and then I'll read the... Well, it's, it seems like more description. So when holding this connection as lightly as I can to keep the connection throughout the day, my breath is labored. I can't seem to breathe deeply until I relax my stomach and lose my connection. Is this normal? Am I doing something wrong? Okay, so these are, you know, these are a bunch of questions, but they're all really related. They're all kind of, um, I think I might be able to help through one answer to all of these questions. So first, the 10% the rule is not a rule to mean that you need to do it a hundred percent of the time or all all day long the rule is especially in these first two modules that you're going to get more benefit to training your deep core muscles at a lower intensity and so 10 percent or lower would be my recommendation to do the training in these first two modules and and it is a good level of in intensity to have your in your mind throughout daily activities because most daily activities are not high intensity but you know if you're going to be doing an activity like like lifting an, a heavy object or like pushing something or whatever most things on top of sitting standing and walking might require a, a more than a 10 percent might be require 50 percent if you're in the gym lifting a barbell or a dumbbell um, it might require a hundred percent. So it's our scale and you're ramping up and ramping down to match what you're doing. 
If you're just resting on the couch watching Netflix, you might be at 0%. If you're sitting on the couch, uh, you know, doing something with your arms, it might be 2%. Uh, if you're sitting without a backrest on a, on a stool, it might be 10%. Uh, so the, these, this is the scale and you're, you're matching it with the intensity of the activity um, and, and you're, ma you're matching your core connection with that. So that's part one of my answer. And so that's kind of hopefully to clear up that it's not a 10% um, all, all day long. It's just kind of a rule to give you guidance on, uh, you know, that we are doing things at a low intensity. Now, with the stomach sticking out, this is probably, if you're not overweight, I think you mentioned that, it's probably an indicator of uh, anterior pelvic tilt and not so much um, like fat or anything like that. And so uh, most likely it's the hip flexors that are pulling your pelvis into that anterior position. Maybe the tight lower back pulses are also pulling up from the back and uh, encouraging that anterior pelvic tilt. So um, it's going to be a, it's going to be a process. It's going to be a process. I'm going to go full screen. Well, no, cause I need to refer to this. So it's going to be a process over a period of weeks and months to change the length tension relationship between your hip flexors, lower back muscles, abdominal muscles, and glutes. That's the cross. That's the cross posture and it doesn't happen overnight. So, uh, depending on how far you are in the program, uh, the, my, my advice is to be patient and continue doing what's been working for you and, uh, and double down on those things. If you've seen any benefit from anything, double and triple down on that and do more of it because it just takes longer, more commitment, more persistence, and more time. Uh, is your assessment accurate? I do believe your assessment is accurate. Um, and yeah, exactly. You know, lost core connection is very, very common. Uh, will sucking in my stomach. I wanted to come in on that because I, I mentioned it earlier. Sucking in your stomach is not the cue that I want to uh, give or I want people to be giving themselves. Sucking in your stomach is abdominal hollowing and is associated with re reduced uh, stability in the spine in the research. And so uh, abdominal bracing is the term that would be more accurate. But uh, what we do in the program, as you said, is just connect to your anchors because we can name the way that you engage your muscles, but it's not really about engaging your muscles. It's about pushing away from your support points, which you developed as a developing infant and a baby. And so if you just uh, go back to that connection, the right muscles, the right engagement will happen automatically and you don't have to suck in. Uh, you just have got to, right now I can just connect. I just connected to my, my back anchor and my, all three of my anchors, my, also my front anchors. And it just is an automatic posture correction. And so in the beginning, it might not be that easy to just do like that, but you're going to build up that familiarity. Um, so just wanted to come in on the sucking in the stomach. I would change your cue to connect uh, rather than sucking in because that's not actually what we teach. Um, but I know it sounds like you're already doing it the right way. You just you said the cue a little differently than I would. Um, all right. And then, yeah, so intentionally keeping your core connected all day. Uh, it's ideal, but you're going to reach fatigue, especially if you're trying to do 10% all day. So allow yourself to drop down to 2%, 1%, 0% at times when you're resting so that you can uh, build back up when you need that 10% or that 50%. So it's a scale, it's a constantly moving scale. It's a dense with your body. And uh, ultimately, the goal is for it to become automatic. So it, it's like when you were a child you didn't think about this stuff because it was automatic and your spine was protected. Uh, so we need to restore that by regrooving the pattern and uh, sticking with it for a long enough period of time so it sinks down into become the default firing pattern of our movement. And that takes many months. I think six months to a year is my best estimate. Um, and then let's see, is this normal? Am I doing something wrong? So. The, that question is for this. When holding this connection lightly, 
uh, my breath is labored. No, I don't think it's wrong. I think that we're, you're changing a, bre a pre-existing breathing pattern that you may have had for so long that the breath is so used to spilling out the front. I'm going to just say that's highly likely that's what's happening. Your breath is just spilling out the front and there's an easy expansion out your belly because it's already, uh, it's just like been molded by that pattern that for probably many years. And so you take away that expansion well, the breath is going to have a hard time finding a place to go and that's going to make your breath more shallow and uh is going to feel like you are having a hard time taking a deep breath and and that's uh part of the process of the ad adaptation of your body of making this change and i just kind of want to say joshua that it sounds like you're doing something right and these, these i, I kind of commend you for for being so deliberate about uh, you know what's being taught in the program and and applying it to your body and applying it to your daily life and and I think that just having some patience with allowing your body to make the changes I don't know what just happened there uh, allowing your body to make the changes um, over a period of weeks and months is uh, probably is 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 I think what needs to happen. And so, you know, the mental component is the confidence and the patience. And as long as you're not hurting yourself and not getting worse, uh, if you're noticing any benefits at all, you're doing the right thing, keep going and the body will adapt. It takes time. So hopefully that helps. I see Sherry here in the chat. Uh, if the foam roller is too intense, is using a tightly rolled yoga mat going to be sufficient? uh yeah that should be sufficient sherry and um if you are already on a white colored foam roller then you can disregard what i'm saying but if you're not then i would recommend getting one because the white foam roller is softer and less intense and uh potentially it could be the right level of firmness for you if you have a foam roller that is too firm, like even if it's the white foam roller and you want to soften it up, you can actually wrap the foam roller in your yoga mat and that will add some cushion to the foam roller. And the, so you won't have the problem that you might have if it's only the rolled up yoga mat, which it will be kind of a too narrow of a cylinder, too small of a cylinder. So you can, you can, you can get that uh, you know, the, what, what do you call it? The diameter of your cylinder is going to be, um, uh, big enough that it'll, it'll be more beneficial. And, it, and it's not easy to have a foam roller that's too thick. So don't worry about that. Like if it, it'll be like three inches thicker than a normal foam roller, that's fine. And they have something called the chirp wheel, which is like huge in diameter, but it still offers really similar benefits. So, uh, yeah, that's my idea. And then you say also the foam roller seems to be too large in diameter and too hard. Oh, you that's interesting. I was just talking about that, at least in my current state of wellness, fitness, pain. So actually, Sherry, the diameter of the foam roller is uh, considered. Um, it's it's directly related to. Uh, no, it's inversely related with intensity. So the, the bigger the diameter, the lower the intensity. And the smaller the diameter, you could imagine a really narrow diameter is going to be high intensity because there's more surface contact, or sorry, less surface contact. And with less surface contact, but the same amount of weight, you're going to have higher intensity pressure. And so a bigger foam roller, like the largest size chirp wheel is... Uh, the, and you might want to check this product out because it is um, it has cushion on it. I bought one for my dad because the foam roller is too intense for him. And um, so you can check that out for sure. Chirp wheel and the largest wheel. There's three sizes. The largest wheel is the least intense and the smallest wheel is the most intense because of that very reason. So I, I wouldn't associate the diameter being too sm too large with being too hard. I, I think that if you add that that cushion by wrapping your 
uh, foam roller in your yoga mat that you might just find that is uh, it'll be just right for you. Um, and also, you could try the the white foam roller because it sounds like you don't have that already. So uh, yeah, if you save a little money, just wrap your existing foam roller. Or um, if you want to try that white one, it is uh, you know is a decent amount of softness compared to like a black one or uh, some of the other you know random colored ones that they have. So hopefully that helps. And I think that's it for today. So. We are through another one. We went about a little more than an hour. And uh, let's see, we still got a few people here. So thank you all for being here live. And as you probably know, we do this every week. So I'll be back next Wednesday with another topic. Uh, if you have any topic suggestions, please feel free to uh, submit them or send them in the chat or, or uh, let us know somehow. Uh, we're always taking suggestions. I'm thinking about doing a topic on nutrition for back pain. So maybe that'll be next week. Uh, what is the ideal diet for back pain? And if you're, you know, trying to trying to increase all of your odds and all the elements for getting out of the cycle, um, that'll probably be a future topic. And then, uh, yeah, if you if you feel like this stream, this topic of hanging for decompression might help somebody send it to them and and uh, just, you know copy the link and send it over and uh, you know help a friend out help a family member out so um, that's what we want to do we kind of trying to we're trying to spread the word about core balance training uh, and uh, anything that you can do such as hitting that like button is very helpful for us to uh, do whatever you got to do with that YouTube algorithm. It's not my specialty, but that's what they tell me. So hit that like button, uh, subscribe if you haven't already. And thank you all for being here. I appreciate you all. And um, until next time, get down on the floor and connect to your core. See you next week, everyone.